Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk to Kamil Maman, a veteran journalist from Turkey. He, has, he had a very long career with successful news stories in Turkey, which one of the most important one is the Riza Zerab case, but not limited to that. He's the, he has been a journalist over 10 years and worked in many aspects of journalism. And today we'll, we'll get to know him a little more and also ask him about what is all about Riza Zerab case in Turkey and in the United States. Uh, welcome, Kamil Maman. Hello and welcome. Unfortunately, the news reporters are not known in Turkey, which is the negative side of our job. I started studying journalism at Istanbul University in 2002 and graduated from there. I started working while I was studying. I worked at Jihan News Agency in newspapers such as Zaman, Yeni Şafak and Bugün. I was mostly working as a crime and security reporter but also did news on health, economy and tourism. And I was specialized in history of coups in Turkey. I was doing research and preparing news pieces on coups in Turkey. While I was preparing these news pieces, I wrote two biographical and historical books out of the sources I collected. One of them is called Karadefter, the Black Notebook which is about the early Republican period and the memories of one of the founding figures of the Republic, who was also head of the Martial Law Court. I found his memories written 90 years ago and published it. The other book is named Demokratler, Democrats, which is about the memories of the founder of the Democratic Party, Rafik Koraltan. Following these, I did many news, of course, I was working on special reports. I was only following the events that have major influence in Turkish society. One of the most important news I did in my life as a journalist was the Reza Zarab case which is discussed in the world media now. I was working as a news reporter at Bugün newspaper in 2015 and then our newspaper was shut down as a result of the pressure of the government and Erdogan. All my colleagues and I were left unemployed without getting paid compensation or anything. As a journalist now, I share my opinions on social media and in alternative media outlets like yours. Very sorry to hear that, you know, especially the fact that your, your newspaper was closed. But as you said, you have you have looked into many yes. important cases, especially about uh, security, bureaucracy, judiciary, and we know Turkey has has had a lot of uh, big incidents in recent years, and you have done news about that. So, didn't you have any problems at all? You know, like we know, Turkey is a very very hard place to do journalism. Were you spared from this, or did you have any troubles making big news about influential people? Of course, because I follow the risky, intriguing and mysterious events that involve politicians and the behind the scenes of such events, so of course a lot has happened to me, especially since the beginning of my career as a journalist, I have been sued by politicians like 30 or 40 times. Most of them happened after the Reza Zarab affair, with the corruption and bribery investigation against the government on 17th of December 2013. President Erdogan sued me 25 times, accusing me of insulting him personally. The Prime Minister of the time, Ahmed Davutoglu, sued me three times. The Minister of European Union Affairs, Egemen Bausch, who is accused of receiving bribery from Reza Zarab, sued me three or four times. Erdogan's son, Bilal Erdogan, also sued me. Alongside these, in order to prevent me from doing my job, Erdogan's special prosecutors undertook legal action against every news I made which might have disturbed Erdogan's regime before any complaints. 
These allegations include attempting to manipulate the legal process in Turkey. In total of these 25 cases against Erdogan, I was being tried for 130 years of imprisonment. If you add the other cases on top of this, it makes 200 years. And after July 15, as you know, every critical journalist was accused of being a terrorist. From Jan Dündar of Jumhuriyet newspaper to the left-wing Kurdish or pro gulen movement journalists, they all are accused with the same allegation, that is, being a member of a terrorist organization. According to Erdogan, every journalist who is critical of him is a terrorist, thus has to be prosecuted. I was also tried in another case. When a newspaper was shut down, I was arrested and judged in the court with 35 years of imprisonment. I was sentenced to one and a half years of imprisonment for nothing. I was unable to work because I was going to court three days a week. I am not the only one who experienced this. Many other journalists experienced similar things. But because of being a crime reporter, the government was suing me to prevent me from making news about these affairs. So we can safely say that you are the most persecuted journalist by Erdogan. Because I know uh, Jan Dundar has uh, one or two very important cases against him, but by far you are the most persecuted journalist by Erdogan. And uh, and we will also know that it's not only journalists now, like Amnesty International Chair, uh, Amnesty Turkey Chair Taner Kilic is is imprisoned by Erdogan on the same charges of uh, being member of a terrorist organization. Having said that. Uh, can we talk a little about how did you find about uh, uh, Riza Seraf case as, as, as a piece of journalism? How did you find the leads? How did you follow them up? And how did you ma create the story that becomes actually part of the indictment uh, in the United States at the moment? I did not plan to make this news piece at all. I was not aware that there was a person in Turkey named Reza Sarab. I did not even know he was married to singer Ebru Gündesh because I was not following it. There is misinformation about how I made the report about the Reza Zarab affair. First of all, I told the police who were investigating the Reza Zarab affair about how I had heard about it and they were surprised. As a crime reporter, I was working at the Istanbul Courthouse, one of the biggest courthouses in Turkey. I got information from a lawyer named Mustafa Doğan Inal. He used to work at Yeni Shafak and when I was working there he was my lawyer too. Now he is the lawyer of President Erdogan, his son-in-law Minister Berat Albayrak, Usma Kutub and Yasin Al-Kadi, whose name was heard in public during the 1725 December corruption investigations. You know Yasin al-Qadi is in the terror list because of his links to al-Qaeda and there is a group known as Tahshia in Turkey who is close to al-Qaeda. Mustafa Doğan Inal is now the lawyer of these kind of people. At the time when I was working at Yeni Shafak, when I encountered him in the courthouse, he told me that Iran has front companies in Turkey and launders money. He told me there is an investigation about it and he told it to some journalists from different newspapers, but no one wanted to make news about it. At the time he did not know about Reza Zarab or that he was involved in it. He gave me the legal complaint of an informant about the incident, which he took from a prosecutor he knew. I was flabbergasted when I saw the document because the amount of money was huge. A person named Reza Zarab had a team and violated the United States sanctions on Iran. The amount of money transferred between 2009 and 2013 was 97 billion euros. According to recent information, this continued until 2015. When I saw the amount, 
97 billion euros, I thought it was a fake report because we, journalists, receive many fake reports, so I did not take it seriously. But the informant states in his late legal complaint that he has documents which he sent to the President, Prime Minister, the Prime Ministry Inspection Board and the Ministry of Finance. His name and number were on the legal complaint and I gave him a call to see what it was really about. At the beginning, he was hesitant and denied that he was the whistleblower. Sheriff Derji, that was the name on the legal complaint. Half an hour later, he called me back and wanted to meet me. When I went to visit him, I saw that he had documents. The state reward people who report any tax fraud. I learned that it was the reason he reported this affair. My impression of him was that he was a person who does his job properly. All the documents, the bank transactions, etc., were real. I told him that I was going to investigate them and I could not make news only taking one side's opinions. We ended the meeting after I stated that I was going to make news about it after the investigation. I started investigating and that time period was like a Hollywood film. I went to my sources in the Ministry of Finance, asked inspectors and then asked my sources in security forces. I collected all the data I could find. And then I searched for information open to the public like the Internet, previously published news and media. I noticed they were all right in front of our nose, but we did not see it. I found out that 10 people were stopped at the border by Russian police with their suitcases full of money, and I investigated it further, like, who are these people? Who owns the money? I investigated the company numbers of these front companies and their records, like who are the shareholders of these companies. And I found out that some of these carriers are the same people. I noticed there were money transfers to Reza Zarab's bank account at HSBC from these front companies. That is how I figured out these companies were linked with Reza Zarab. Some of the mobile phone numbers of these carriers I registered to Reza Zarab's official companies. When I put the pieces of the puzzle together, I understood that this was an organized criminal group violating the United States sanctions on Iran. When I finished preparing the news, our editor-in-chief, Erhan Bashur, told me that the claims were strong, so it could be better if I asked to counter opinions from respective people in the news. So. He said he did not want the newspaper to be sued because of this, and not to blame any innocent people. Then I called Reza Zarab. He said on the phone, you make the news and we will defend ourselves in the court. I called one of Reza Zarab's staff named Adam Gelgich. He stated that it is reported to the state and it was not our business. I wrote all these answers in my news piece. After I finished preparing the news, Egemen Baj, Mohamed Gulel, Hussein Chelik, Zafar Chale and the ministers of the time, all of them called Erhan Bashut, Akhmipek and Adem Yawuz Aslan to say Reza Zarab is a philanthropic businessman, that he contributes to the Turkish economy and all the information in the news were fake. They started to put pressure on us in order to stop us from publishing the news. After lots of phone calls that they received, the editors of the newspaper asked me again whether my sources and documents were reliable. I told them every detail. After the ministers called the newspaper, they noticed it was a big affair and told me that I caught a really big fish. But people continued calling our newspaper. Reza Zarab was scared of the news being published. The pressure continued for a couple of weeks and it slowed us down. Later on, Yeni Shafak made news about the affair covering only tiny bits of it. Thus, we did not publish the news. After the 17th of December corruption investigation, everyone learnt it. 
So, uh, in effect, you have uncovered the story, you have made your research, you have uh, went to the sources themselves, talked to experts on the field, and you made up your story, and it disturbed many people, and it stirred some, some dissent among the you know, ministers of the government at that time, which they rang the, the newspaper and told them not to publish the news, and which put you in a pause mode, effectively, and then somewhere else, a, a pro-government newspaper has break the story or part of it, which let the news die. And then, as I understand, a, a month later, uh, you know, like the indictment came anyway. And we will talk about all, all the details because I'm just trying to inform the audience here. Because uh, after this point, after you start ringing Riza Saraf and asking his opinion on the, on the news, actually that, that phone call is um, among the tapes that are recorded as, as, as phone calls and, and we, we, we have all seen that and we'll, we'll talk in detail. But I want to come to one final point about what is the difference between the uh, case of corruption in Turkey in 17th of December, the, the way you unveiled an embargo, uh, a scheme that aims to, let's say, violate the rules of embargo and create some sort of a, a bribery ring in Turkey. And what is the difference, the, the case in the in, in United States right now about Riza Zera? Can you talk a little about that? I want to add something before it. When I was investigating this news, Istanbul Financial Crimes Police were tracking Reza Zarab. As I was investigating the affair, my name was written in the legal file as a witness, and the Istanbul Prosecution Office asked my statement after the December 17th investigation. The legal investigation was under the risk of being ex exposed when I was preparing the news. Also, two of the ministers bribed by Z Reza Zarab were trying to prevent the news from being published. Mohamed Güler received uh, one and a half million Turkish liras, and Egemen Baş received five hundred thousand dollars. The police recorded these as they were tracking Reza Zarab. If we come back to your question now, what is the legal process in Turkey and the USA about the affair? As the accused people are the same, these two processes are being confused. The law is different in Turkey and the USA. In Turkey, Reza Zarab worked with ministers and their children to violate the USA's sanctions on Iran. They violate Turkish law by transferring money to Iran. What are these crimes? fraud by fake documents, and they cooperate with bank managers in Turkey, especially Halk Bank. Halk Bank's managers and deputy managers fabricated fake documents with Reza Zarab. One of the ministers of the time, Zafer Çale, and helped them. They committed fraud by false representation of trade. They pretended as if they were trading. In order to keep the system going, they bribed politicians and state officers. In Turkey, legal action was taken against this corruption, not against the violation of the USA's sanctions on Iran. Only the corruption in Turkey during violations of these sanctions. But it is different in the states. Violation of sanctions is violation of the American law. It is fraud against the international banking system. Fraud against the United States. We did not see all these documents, but I think they are forgery by false transactions when transferring money between banks. Another crime is violation of the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. In the United States, this is a law approved by the United Nations. No one can violate it. This is the main crime of this group. This is accepted as federal crimes. In Turkey, the crimes are bribery and forgery. The allegations in the USA are bigger. They would not be judged with the same allegations in Turkey. The prosecutors requested Reza Zarab to be judged for 90 years of imprisonment. He would not be judged with that big scale of allegations in Turkey. The legal sanctions are softer in Turkey. There are also allegations of Turkish ministers and AKP politicians taking bribes 
in order to conceal a U.S. sanctions busting machine with the order of Erdogan himself. Because high-profile politicians are involved, it attracted more public attention. Thank you very much. It was very helpful. I'll, I'll try to keep it brief every time, but next time we'll talk about whether, you know, 17th of December corruption allegations were similar to 25th of December corruption allegations or, or in, in, a, in a way they are continuation of each other. I know Reza Zerab mentioned in both of them, but in a different way as, as I understand. We'll talk about that. And then we'll talk also about uh, the, the actual case that is in, in America now and what is the implications and what may happen and what's, what's going on. Uh, thank you very much uh, and uh, for, for enlightening us about this important topic. We'll come back to you again. Uh, Kamil Maman was with us, who's a veteran journalist uh, in, in Turkey, who, who is the guy who found out uh, the Riza Zerab case as a piece of news before the allegations surfaced by the uh, prosecutors in, in Turkey. Thank you very much. Thank you.